Hey, greetings everyone. It is GleeCon, and we are back again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. Last episode was the day before yesterday. I actually forgot. Yesterday I was, uh, you know, I worked, I came home, um, started kicking around doing some things around the house, and then I uh, I was planning on doing Nomergon on Classic with the wifey. We sat down to play, and I was like, oh crap, I never made my video. So I had originally planned it, but it's just uh, through my own my own uh, brain getting old. But on that previous episode, we continued this the grind where we killed the the tigers with Talanji. Um, it was tough. On the next one, uh, we'll do the panthers. Same kind of story. I did it off camera with the with the warlocks, uh, and it really wasn't much easier. But we'll talk about that next episode tomorrow. Um, we've also been reading through this book that you see before you, The War of the Scaleborn, and on the last one, we really talked about what the, how the Order of Dragons um, want to confront the war that is that is nigh. So they decide to basically close off their borders, and um, you get to see the arsenal that Nelbarians built, and they're still not going to go on the offensive, but um, we're looking at their own little preparations for war. I think they also... We're going to try to like try to get the mortal races on their side, help with that. Um, so they have their own, some plans that could help them. And you see the beginnings of how this book is going to end, where they're starting to plan on a way to put these, uh, as the primals in a sort of a stasis. So stay a while and listen as we do chapter 17 of Lore of Warcraft. As the sun rose, Ysera hovered in the skies above the Emerald Gardens, looking to the west. Three hundred wing lengths from where she flew, a delicate green shimmer lifted from the borders of her territory, so slight only the members of the green dragonflight would be able to perceive it. Any incarnate or primal who flew through that barrier would wither like an autumn leaf. Today, not even the gentle breezes from the dream could calm me Sarah's nerves. Small birds fluttered around her horns, singing their sun-warmed songs to her, but their sweetness could not touch the green aspect's heart. All attempts at diplomacy and peace had failed. Now the aspects would test the strength of their barriers. If magic failed, the flight stood ready to defend the broodlands by wing and by talon. Behind her, the full might of the green dragon flight filled the skies, ready to repel a primalist attack. Her flight masters flanked her, three on the left, two on the right, while her majordoma, the Thera, flew at her right wing. Their numbers looked twice as large thanks to the blue dragon flight's illusory army. Ysera had those dragons positioned to the south, hoping to encourage the incarnates to attack the north of the gardens. A regiment of Neltharian's Iron Scales joined them, led by Garion, a veteran of the Battle of Storm Sunder Crater. The Iron Scales took point, forming a bulwark between the Green Dragon Flight and the border. On the ground, Green Draconid bristled around the portal to the Emerald Dream. Elder Drakes had also taken positions inside the portal, prepared to dispatch any enemy who tried to force their way through. If the barriers failed, the Verdant Preservers stood ready to defend their flight, but Ysera desperately hoped it would not come to that. Fifty of her best warriors had already gone to Wormrest Temple, where they'd helped to raise defenses, move herds of northern caribou west, and chase the primalists from the surrounding environs. What a war, war is a waste, Mithira said softly, so only the green dragon could hear. I am not afraid to stand in defense of the Emerald Plains, my aspect, but I wish it had not come to this. As do I, but our flight's magic is strong, Ysera replied. The barriers around our lands will hold. They will, Ythera said with a resolute nod. They must. The first bugle sounded. On the western horizon, a horde of primalists crested a nearby mountain range. So numerous were they, the dragons looked like ants spilling out a mounded nest. Though the green dragon flight flew in full force, they were still far outnumbered. Steady! Garion shouted from the front line. Talion! Zorastia! Take your wing units and prepare to flank them in the south! We do not want to fight in the skies over the gardens! As the iron scales adjusted their ranks, the primalists flew closer, ever closer. Ysera could now see Farak flying in their midst. Her sister had told her to expect the blazing one, as Virenoth would likely assail the Reach while the Riddicron tried to break the Obsidian Citadel. The three incarnates would slam into the Broodlands' western flank, forcing the Aspects to fight on three fronts rather than one. Naltharion was at the Obsidian Citadel, and Alexstrasza had gone north to defend the Reach from the Lifebinder Conservatory. Farrakh and his armies flew, drew closer. 
Courage now, Ysera called, still hoping her flight would not have need of it this day. As the first wave of primalists crossed into the Emerald Plains, a bright flash of viridescent light exploded across the sky. The primal dragons seized and contorted in the air, shrieking, their living tissue withering on the bone. As they plummeted to the earth, their wing leaders trumpeted a halt. A thousand primal dragons crashed to a stop, nearly knocking more of their front lines through the barrier. A great cheer exploded from the green dragon flight. Barak flew up to the barrier, which sparked and snapped in his presence. Isara, he roared. What is the meaning of this? Come and face me on the field of battle, you coward! You will not slake your thirst with the blood from our throats, Farak, Isara said, launching herself over the heads of the iron scales. Return to Harrow's Deep. Return to your foul dens. The battle you seek is not here. With a furious roar, Farak spat a fireball at the green aspect. She dived backward, dodging with ease. Mark my words, Farak said. When I return, the first thing I intend to do is burn your precious gardens to the ground. As Farak and the Primalist turned tail, Garion joined Ysera in the skies. Would you like us to give chase, Lady Ysera? The Flightmaster asked. No, Ysera said. Let our enemies seek out bloodshed. We will remain here unless we are needed. Let us hope the other aspects have fared just as well. As the Aspect's new barriers glimmered on the Broodlands' borders, Talon Strauss gathered his friends in the maze-like waterways of the Waking Shores. More than twenty drakes from all five flights met in the backwaters beneath the Lifebinder's conservatory, hidden from their elders' watchful gazes. The Red's closest friends, Siragosa and Nolis Dormu, came immediately, as did many of the drakes he had befriended at Wormrest Temple. Abezion and Ravia, the twin black dragons who saved his life on the battlefield, joined them too. Siragosa bounded up to him, her azure scales glimmering. Talon Straz, we feared you dead, she butted her head against his gently. You dense dragon, I'm glad you're safe. I'm all right, I promise you, Talon Straz said with a laugh. It's been three moons since the battle at Wormrest Temple, Nulla's Dormu said, Sam dancing through his golden gaze. What happened to you, my friend? I admit I can't see aught in your past. Come, I will tell you everything, Talon Straz said, beckoning them to follow him into a large-mouthed, ivy-draped cave. When the last drake sidled inside, twenty pairs of curious eyes turned his way. After the battle at Wormrest Temple, he began, I followed Viranoth the Frozen Heart to her airy in the fangs. Several drakes gasped, rearing back in alarm. An incarnate? Someone hissed, heads cocked to catch whispers. Several dragons shifted their weight or narrowed their eyes. Siragosa and Nolas Dormu exchanged a glance, but said nothing. Talonstraus continued, Not more than a clutch of moons ago, the Incarnates caught a titan forge stealing eggs from a primal dragon's nest in the wilds. Over the last two centuries, Viranoth, est Viranoth estimates that hundreds, if not thousands, of eggs have been kidnapped from the wilds, and I believe that every drake here was among the stolen clutches. We were raised together in the ruby life pools, Talonstraus went on. It would have been so easy to hide us among the trueborn ordered. But can you name your parents, Zendormu? Zenadormu. What about you, Talagosa? Other drakes have parents, but where are ours? The drake's murmurs deepened to growls. Abezion and Ravia shared a look. Iramos, Zenadormu, and Miragosa spoke together in low tones, their fangs flashing. They too had memories much like Talon Straz's. We were not given the choice our brethren had, Talon Straz said, stepping forward and spreading his wings. Why did the Aspects take us from our parents and force order upon us when others were granted a choice in the matter? Are you sure, Talon Straz, Siragosa said, the confusion clear on her face. But the Dragon Queen, she promised. Did she lie to us? Talagosa asked with a rasp. No, another voice said. The Dragon Queen would never lie. What evidence do they have of this? said another. And how do you know the frozen heart is not lying to you? Talon Straz, Ravia said, lifting her voice above the crowds. She turned her gaze on him. I heard Viranoth speak at Wormrest Temple too, but I'm unable to trust her words. She also called Razageth's sister. Razageth, the very dragon who turned tooth and talon against my flight. Many good dragons died that day, including my own wing leader and mentor. Her brother, Abezion, curled his lips. You would have us fly with the monsters who would set our home aflame? 
They are not monsters, Talon's jaws snapped. I had to put a fistful of Zoltika's ashes into the lava cauldrons of the Obsidian Citadel because of Razageth, Ravia said, stepping forward, her voice rising. Tell me, what have you lost besides your so-called choice? Ravia's words rattled in Talonstraz's teeth. For a moment, he wavered in his determination, but no, no. Razageth may have been violent, even cruel, but Viranoth was not the Storm Eater. Viranoth was as ancient as the glaciers. Wise, kind, steady. If she had turned against Alex Straza after all the long centuries, she must have had good reason to do so. A choice is power over one's own destiny, Talon Straz said, echoing something Viranoth had said to him. All the drakes in the Broodlands deserve to know about the Aspect's treachery. Treachery? Obezion said, shooting Talon Straz a cool, measured look. Who in the Broodlands will believe you? Do you think the Dragonflights will trust the word of an incarnate, a betrayer, over the word of our queen? Viranoth is not a betrayer, Talonstraz said, lifting his voice. It is Alexstraza who has betrayed us all. Abezion growled, a deep and throaty rumble that silenced every other conversation around them. Though not the oldest, Abezion was easily the largest among the assembled drakes. He stood a full talon length taller than Talonstraz did at the shoulder, and the black drake was broader, too, thanks to his work in the forges of the Obsidian Citadel. The other drakes backed away from Abezion, sensing violence. Ravia, however, remained at her brother's side, watching the scene with dispassion. Talonstraz tensed, ready for a fight. You would speak ill of the Dragon Queen, Abezion said. Talonstraz snarled, fl flashing fang. I speak the truth, Abezion. It is not my fault if you refuse to hear it. Then I wish I had not saved your sorry scales at Wormrest, Abezion said, pushing his forefoot into the earth. Perhaps I will rectify that mistake. The earth rumbled with a small quake, knocking Talon Straws off balance. Abezian leapt at him, the light glinting off his massive talons. Talon Straws rolled out of range, found a foothold, and whirled. Abezian moved faster, pivoting and slamming his barbed tail into Talon Straws's cheek. Bright lights exploded across Talon Straws's vision. He staggered, shaking his head. Just as chaos erupted in the cavern, someone roared. That is enough! With all the fury and authority of a flight leader. Talon Straza's heart stuttered in his chest. He pivoted, fully expecting to face the wrath of Alex Straza, or at least one of the flight masters. To his surprise, it was only Layla Straza, his sister. His sanctimonious, moralizing sister, the golden whelp of the waking shores. She had barely seen 50 summers, and the wing leaders of the Red Dragon Flight already compared her to the Dragon Queen herself. Layla Straza shouldered the curtain of ivy aside, striding into the cavern. Three drakes accompanied her, a second red, Ima Straz, who followed Layla Straz like a shadow, sworn to protect her, a green, a tyrannous, her dearest and closest friend, and a blue, Rygos, who had often been at odds with Talon Straz thanks to his sharp tongue and quick wit. Layla Straza still enjoyed the friendships of their whelphood, though Talon Straz had turned to Siragosa and Nola's Dormu decades ago. Layla Straza, Talon Straz said with a little growl, this is none of your business. I came at your behest, Layla Straza said. Were you not sent to Wormrest Temple for fighting, brother? Now that you have been forbidden to fight the primal dragons, you choose to turn your talons on your kind. Whether they are my kind is debatable. Your brother spoke ill of the Dragon Queen in the Aspects, Sebezian said to her. I struck to defend Alex Straza's name. What? Layla Straza blinked, giving her head a small shake. What would compel you to speak ill of the Queen? Of our flight's own aspect, Talon. The aspect stole our eggs from the wild sister, Talon Shaw said, though he felt sure his words would fall on closed ears. After the battle at Wormrest Temple, I met with Viranoth the Frozen Heart. Layla Straza drew back from him with a hiss. You spoke to that betrayer? Listen to me, Talon Straza said. Alex Straza lied to us about how and when our eggs were taken, Layla Straza. The aspects kidnapped us from our true parents. No doubt because she foresaw how the Uncarnates would tear Dragonkind apart, Layla Straza snapped. It is the Aspects who tear us apart, Helen Straz said, glaring at his sister. They have driven a wedge into the hearts of our kind, and now we go to war in further service of their treachery? The group seemed stunned by this outburst, but Helen Straz couldn't stop himself. The Dragon Queen chose what shape I would take in life. I will not let her choose my death. I would sooner join the Primalists. 
The other drakes looked at him in shocked silence, eyes wide. Obezium was the first to move, blowing out a breath and muttering a curse. He strode from the cavern, followed closely by his twin, Ravia. You are my clutch brother, Talon Strauss, Leila Straza said. Never doubt my love for you, but I will not follow you down this path. If you wish to rebel against the aspects, you will do so on your own. With that, Leila Straza turned and followed Obezion out of the cavern. You cannot mean that, Talon Straz said. They took your choice away from you. My choice to be what, Leila Straza said, whirling. A primal drake in the wilds of Kalimdor, bereft of the magic, struggling for survival. To be unexceptional, unremarkable, unenlightened as to what dragonkind can achieve. To struggle against my own kind for resources instead of banding together to overcome our shared challenge. No, brother. I would not choose to walk when I can fly. Talon Straz frowned. You don't understand. No, it is you who do not understand, she said, lifting her voice. You choose not to understand the power of the gifts you have been given, of the life you have led. You let past injuries undermine your future. But I swear to you this day, if you raise wing and talon against our queen, you will not live to see the morrow. With that, Leila Straza left the cavern and took wing. Her comrades followed her, shooting wary gazes over their shoulders. Anyone else? Talon Straza asked, his voice rasping, throat tight. Scarce ten drakes stayed, including Siragosa and Nola's Dormu. Let his soft-scaled sister go. Her words could not restore the choice that had been stolen from him. When no one else left, he said, Good. Then let us discuss our first move. Yeah, so that's down. Now, the only, I guess, they could still do damage as sort of like an internal cell. Hopefully these other dragons are smart enough to um, snitch on him. But yeah, this is definitely... Um, you're, the Order Dragons are reaping what they're sowing right now. All right, we have another episode of the Pipe 5x5. Five five. Thanks so much, everyone, for watching, for listening, and for tuning in. As always, you rock, and I'll see you next time on Lore of Warcraft.